could not make it live. Um, bill schedule was circulated and actually was approved yesterday. So we have the next item up on the agenda, the subcommittee assignments for next year or for this year now at this point. A um, couple of them we've carried over already, which has been negotiations already. Um, the I guess I'll, what I'll do is rather than going through each of them, we have fiscal strategy. Uh, this past year was myself and Susie, with Suzanne as the alternate. Education, which was David and Susie. Jim is the alternate. Long range planning, myself and Jim with David as the alternate. Policy, Suzanne and David with Jim as the alternate. And negotiations, which will carry over, is Suzanne, Jim, and David as the alternate. Um, government study was something we're waiting to hear on the Sluckman if they're going to continue. Uh, that with the Capital Plan Committee, there were two different groups over the past couple of years, um, and if they do need a member. So with that, are there any specific requests for, oh, thank you for showing that. I was looking at the doc. Are there any specific requests for any subcommittee changes? Does anybody have a preference uh, for something that they're not on? <laughs> Yeah. All I ask, Mike, could could we politely ask um, someone to mute? I'm having a hard time hearing you. There's a clicking okay. or something happening. I'm sorry. Sure. No. 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 No worries. If you're if you're obviously you're not speaking, just if you could throw yourself on mute, um, it helps obviously the overall audio quality. Um, hey, Mary Beth, real quick, because I just got a text from David. He says he's having trouble getting in. Um, his comment was, "I'm asking to to join and it won't let me in. Can you see him in the lobby?" No, I can't, but I will um, I will reach out to him. Okay, thank you. I'm just letting you know. And yeah. Go ahead, Suzanne. I'll answer your question, um, and then I have a, another question. I'm fine with uh, where I'm sitting currently, um, unless somebody else who, you know. Uh, but I wondered if we wanted to um, add to this... Um, you wanted somebody designated for the, um, why is the name escaping me? <laughs> the, um, the Titans group. Um, it's just, I'm blanking. The, the high school and the community. Pembroke Titans Against Drugs. Thank you. PTAD, PTAD, that's what uh -huh. I was thinking of. Do we want to add that or at least just have that discussion now? Would that be appropriate? Absolutely. We can definitely have it. Um, you know, at, for th for those of you who aren't aware, in fact, we, we are trying to get PTAD onto our schedule, um, onto an agenda. Um, Mike Cogburn, who is the chair of that subgroup, um, has asked to come in. We just uh, haven't had an opportunity with, between budget and now school reopening and everything we were doing before. So hopefully we'll be able to get him on in the next month or so. So... The, the folks who are, um, who PTAD, Pembroke Titans Against Drugs, is a, um, I guess, pseudo town group. They do their own fundraising, although they're appointed by the Board of Selectmen. Um, it is um, Aaron as a superintendent of schools, um, a representative from the police department. Um, it, it, myself, I've been the on since Ginny left the committee a few years ago. Mike's on. Um, Hank Galligan, uh, Dr. Gina Boutwell, Cindy Wengren. That is the and Matt Newman represents the Board of Health. So the the objective of the group is to to raise awareness um, on drug and alcohol uh, within uh, you know within the community. Um, a, a drug and alcohol abuse within the community. The group has funded, um, funds us um, a helpline uh, for people looking for different services. The group also has um, funds a uh, sixth grade dare, a sixth grade uh, PTAD promise. They fund children at dare camp. Um, Aaron, what am I missing as far as some of the other things that they've done? Sure, um, they fund some of our smaller groups at the high school yep. and the middle school. Um, you know, we call them. Uh, Oh my goodness, the, the word is escaping me. Uh, Children of Promise or Teens of Promise and at some groups within the school day for our students that are struggling um, with recovery or with a family member in recovery. Um, so, you know, accessing 
some um, supports outside of school in addition to our social workers at our school. Um, they also have been partnering with us on the kinship groups that we offer. So um, Cheryl Larson, who's one of our elementary social workers, um, has started a group for um, you know, uh, non-traditional families, so grandparents raising grandchildren or, or whatnot, so that they can get together and have a sense of community and talk about struggles. There's some with that as well. Um, they also offer scholarships to our high school seniors, um, uh, and I think they are, you know, always ready, willing, and able to support any type of those activities in our school as well. So we've talked about, you know, setting up a grant program with them so that, you know, staff can um, petition them directly to fund resources and materials for um, some of these conversations K through 12. Yeah, so that's actually before we go into that, uh, I mean, I'll see if anybody has questions or interest in that. Um, Mary Beth, some folks are still waiting to get in, I think, besides David. Not sure if you're seeing if there's an issue. So on my end, I'm not seeing that at all. I'm not seeing people trying to get in. That's sometimes if everybody's trying to do it at the same time, it slows it down. So okay. um, I, I'm not getting any alerts or anything that people are trying to get in at this point. Okay, thank you. If anybody knows of anybody who's trying to get in, please uh, just drop in the chat box and we'll look into it. We'll try to make sure we get everybody on. So, so based on that, is there any questions about PTAD or is there interest in it? Um, you know, I'm, I've been doing, I'm happy to continue to do it, but if anybody has a, has an interest, clearly you're more than welcome to, um, you know, to join, um, take my spot. I'm sure there's also at lot, it might be even at large spots available. Uh, the group, you know, has, has, was very active at one point is still active, but within a smaller group. So thoughts, questions. So does anyone have um, any desire to move? Like this is Susie, I'm, I'm, I had reached out to, to Aaron. I'm comfortable kind of staying and continuing to learn on the committees I'm on. Okay. Okay, that works well. And we, we can talk offline about the PTAD, but before I come in, I need to kind of know a little bit more about the, sure. the committee, just because of things happening on other committees I'm working with. Sure, okay. absolutely. Yep, and, and we can talk about that. And Mike, uh, Mike like I said, Mike's going to be joining um, in a meeting or two. So, so Mary Beth, can you look in the chat box? There's still some people trying to get in. I'm not sure if you're seeing that. So I'm, I'm not seeing that, Mike, okay. but I, I'm keeping an eye out. I would recommend if you're, if you know, if I'll, I'll put it, it's not helpful to people trying to get in, I know. but I'm just wondering if, um, if sometimes if you log out and then log back in, that will, that does help. I know it sounds silly, but it does work. So I apologize. Yeah. I, I can, I can say if people are willing to just call in and listen and not do the video, the phone in number on the agenda and the pin number works really well. That's what I've done. And it's very clear. I can hear everybody. Okay. Okay. Um, not sure what we can do at this point. Um, yeah, I'm going to search the Google, Google issue or where it is. <clears throat> but, um, you know, again, if people can, if people are trying to get in, if you could just, again, you tell people so, who are trying to get in just to, to log Mike, out and log back in. So, go I ahead, Jim. Sometimes it's a browser issue, too, if you're going through Chrome. Yeah. That usually uh, makes it a little easier than going through Safari or Edge. Yeah. Definitely. I had this uh, problem before, and I've gone, I've stayed with, with uh, Chrome for this one. Okay. So, with that, um, any questions or thoughts? So at this point, we'll keep the same subcommittees going into next year or into this year, I should say. Sounds good to me. Okay. Hearing no other issues, we'll pass through that. So um, 
Aaron, you want to start talking through the fiscal year 20 close. And what we'll do for this piece here is we'll walk through it, um, get committee member, member, member questions. Then we'll actually do the closeout vote on it just to keep that all together. Because for those of you who are new to this process, it's mostly procedural on how we close out the year. Happy to answer any questions and we'll answer them all. But it just will help to get through the vote. That way, you know, we don't oh, skip it because it has to be done a particular way. And we need to get it done because that also helps the town um, at town meeting. So, Aaron, do you want to walk through the closing and the closing memo? Yes, I do. Let me just share my screen. <laughs> um, the highlight of your year, I know. Sure is. Um, so I think you can see it. I'm hoping you can see it. If you can't see it, yell out because I can't see you. Um, so FY20 closed. This is part of the packet that I sent you all um, earlier in the weekend. And I sent you an updated um, number today because we have um, really finally closed the books today. Um, you know, the hope was to get as much activity done prior to the closing as we possibly could. So I'm going to go through a, a little bit about just kind of the numbers, as Mike said, and then I'll, I'll give you a little more detail on some of the other um, documents and then any questions, happy to answer again. Um, so the FY20 adopted budget um, from the fall town meeting in October, or maybe it was the spring town meeting last year, was $34,108,229. Um, up until today, we've spent $32,133,700, 133,736 dollars and 90 cents. So that leaves an available balance of just under two million dollars. Understanding that the bulk of that money is associated with payroll. So our teachers, as you know, is common case in, in, in many communities, are 26 paycheck teachers. So they re receive summer pay for time that they have for a service they have already completed. So the work through June 30th continues to pay them over the summer. So just about um, 5 million of that balance is, is associated with payroll charges um, for our staff, which are checks um, dated July 21st, August 4th, and August 18th. The first check of FY21 for that staff would be September 1st. Um, in addition to the payroll expenses that we asked to carry forward into the following fiscal year, we have open purchase orders um, in the amount of $492,254.10. Definitely a ton of noise on the other end of the call. I don't know if you guys can hear me or if I, I just I, hear. It's me. tough. So okay. if you can just make, if everybody could just make sure they're muted, it would help. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like somebody's printing off of the computer. So if somebody's printing, could they please mute it? Okay, so we have purchase orders in the amount of $492,254.10 that we would be rolling forward into the next fiscal year. Um, what, what that means is the money was encumbered in FY20, but we just haven't paid the bill yet. Um, a lot of that's a timing issue. Um, let's take utilities, for example. We don't receive our last um, electric bill for the period through June 30th till about July 15th each year. Um, in addition to that, as part of our um, budget conversations. You heard us talk about special education tuition pre-buy. That would be a purchase order. That's an encumbrance moving into the next year. So we use FY20 dollars for a service in FY21 associated with special ed tuition. So that is a big chunk of that encumbrance number is special ed tuition pre-buy. So what you all do um, is vote to recommend the uh, carry forward of the encumbrances in that amount. In addition, you guys vote on the final closeout of the last fiscal year. So prior to FY20 would be FY19. This number represents anything that was left in purchase orders or payroll expenses that was not expended over the period of this year. So anything we encumber in one year, you have one full year to expend. If you do not expend it by the end of that year, it automatically turns into free cash for the town. So these are FY19 purchase orders that we did not act on or, or you know, fully spend um, for various reasons. Sometimes it's price changes, sometimes it's, you know, the items not available various reasons for that um, but the amount of those unspent purchase orders and there's some payroll in there from a workers comp timing issue amount to twelve thousand twelve dollars and eight cents that money would go immediately into the free cash for the town are you all good you with this and i'll share some of the detail or i'm good with that 
Hey, Aaron, just a couple of things. I know you mentioned of that 492, a lot of that is a special education pre-buy, which people uh, may recall. If we've, we've been talking about it, I think, since about April um, during the budget time. So that's where that money shows up. That's why, again, as, as Aaron said, it hasn't been paid, but it's, it's been encumbered and we've issued the purchase order. The second thing is on the uh, $12,012.08, that money goes back to the town and ends up in free cash. So a lot of times people ask, where does free cash come from? It comes from a number of different sources. This is one of them. Um, you know, So when the town has free cash in the fall and is using that to either fund articles or using that to fund stabilization, whatever it happens to be, that's one of the sources where that comes from. So... <clears throat> Any no questions, questions on this, end, Mike and Aaron. Okay. I think it looks pretty straightforward. Aaron, you want to go into Same some here. of the detail? <clears throat> yep. Great. Thank you. So I think you can see it, but if you can't yell out, um, this slide, well, this spreadsheet shows how we spend our money in one year versus um, the the last fiscal year. We're just gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the numbers here. So personnel, a little over 25 million. You'll see, obviously, it's an increase over last year. You'd expect that with step and lane movements of all the staff, as well as cost of living increases. Um, I wanted to highlight some of the areas that are lower this year and talk a little bit about the reasons why. Um, so obviously supplies, um, our expenditures and supplies was just about $300,000 less than it was last year. Obviously, this was part of the cost saving measures that we talked about um, earlier in, March, April, and May, when we were talking about really conserving as many dollars in FY20 as we possibly could. Um, so, you know, with the change from a brick and mortar school day to a remote learning environment, obviously there was savings associated with supplies and materials, um, consumables and classrooms and whatnot. Property services for us are utilities. Um, again, you know, as we talked about in March, April, and May, there is some utility savings associated with the, the closure of the buildings um, to the public. So again, I think when we talked about it, we were in the range of about 40,000, and you can see from the numbers that that's just about where it landed. Um, transportation, again, a, a topic that we've talked extensively about through some of the um, conversations in the earlier part of the spring. Um, savings associated with not transporting students to school during the closure. So again, the transportation expenditures for FY20 are less than FY19. Um, equipment, pretty similar. Purchase services are anything that we um, go outside for. So legal services, uh, plumbing, all kinds of those type of pieces. You'll see our purchase services this year is higher than last year. This feeds into the conversation we've been having since about late December, early January about some of our special ed students. Um, so um, two of our special ed students that moved into the district later in the year required one-to-one -one nursing. That nursing is reflected in this line. So that's why you see such a large increase from one year over the previous year. Here. Miscellaneous for us is um, professional development, travel, those type of things. So again, pretty flat year over year. Obviously less travel of staff um, in the second half of this year than in years past, which is why you see the decrease there. Um, tuitions, and I think it's important just to spend a couple of minutes talking about tuition. Um, the increase here in tuitions reflects not only the shortfall that we had been discussing in December and January, but that pre-buy as well. So we talked about being about $500,000 short in tuition in January, we've talked about a $300 to $350,000 um, sped tuition free buy. Those numbers sync up almost exactly to the difference between this year and last year. Um, so again, all of the, the work towards the latter part of this fiscal year in FY20, so March, April, May, and June, was about putting ourselves in the best position possible moving into 21 with so many unknowns around funding. So um, I think, you know, I think we all anticipate, I anticipated the numbers to look like this, but it's, it's really, satisfying to be in a place of closing where you said you were going to be. And I think that this, this exemplifies that, you know, all of the cost saving measures we discussed were um, acted on and were able to conserve as, as much as we possibly could to set ourselves up for a better um, year. So happy to answer any questions on this one. The, the pie charts are pretty level and they look the same. So. <laughs> Hey, Aaron, thank you very much. Okay. The question on the 2020 budget reflecting tuition, are you getting any kind of guidance or have you had any conversations with your fellow superintendents 
about what we're going to anticipate for FY21. Uh, this was, you know, a bit of a hit. We knew it was coming. Um, certainly, it's going to be one of our biggest challenges if these numbers continue to increase. Uh, and under the COVID financial landscape right now, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm really concerned about what we may be faced with uh, over the near horizon. You got any any direction, any kind of thoughts around what the expectations may be or how we should prepare? Sure, I think the biggest unknown and, and really liability out there is compensatory services for our special education students. So you heard me talk a little bit over the spring around trying to come to an agreement with our um, placement schools around if compensatory services are deemed necessary, what the payment for those services would look like moving into the future if we paid full tuition in the spring. So we did pay full tuition for all of our students um, for the months of March, April, May, and June. So the expectation on the municipality, local school district end is that any compensatory services that would be deemed necessary would be covered by what we already paid in the spring. Again, that would be the ideal setup. Will it actually look like that once the level of service has been identified? Potentially not. So the conversation now, um, there's a bill in the legislature about that that piece in particular around what we need for in the spring, covering necessary services in the fall. But again, there's going to be there's going to need to be a little bit of give and take um, on our end as well, and you know, thinking a little bit more creatively on how we could potentially use our staff. Um, to fulfill some of the compensatory services for students that don't traditionally attend right. our programs, but you know, really working through all of the possibilities to mitigate this as much as we can as a liability. So are, we have are those... in planning our tuitions for the following year. We we do include placeholders for students that we know um, are kind of on the cusp of, of needing a, a placement outside of of Pembroke Public Schools. At the same time, that placeholder list, for lack of a better word. We haven't had eyes on those kids necessarily since March 13th. So some of the students that could arise over the fall into the spring of this year with a return to school may not have been on, on the, the horizon for us. So just keeping a close eye on those students and making sure, you know, I think everybody is anticipating a potential bumpy start to school for some of our students that have been now out since March 13th. So, um, you know, that's, that's where that circuit breaker extraordinary relief piece comes in. Um, you know, if we happen to have expenses like this year that are 125 percent of what we were budgeting, we would then be eligible for that again. So, Erin, how much flexibility are the tuitions fixed? Are they set by the state or do we have any ability to negotiate those rates? We have no ability to negotiate the OST, so Operational Services Division, sets tuition rates for all uh, of those schools. So okay. um, there's no negotiation there. OK. But there was conversation similar to what we share with our state legislatures about freezing the percentage increase moving into next year as everybody here is kind of working on a 112th budget until we get a chapter 70 number, you know, a similar um, type of setup for them moving into the fall as well. Okay. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and follow up to that, are we anticipating any additional um, transportation costs due to additional social distancing that may make that number go up? So that's the million dollar question. We have not received transportation guidance at this point. So um, once that's out, we will, you know, have to kind of look at our students and our placements and our routes and see, um, you know, even with special education transportation, the, the guidance from DESC has been, as, has been to encourage parent transportation as much as possible whenever possible. So there is a system set up for families to transport to our placements. They are eligible for mileage reimbursement. Um, we do have a couple of families that access that as opposed to us providing a, um, a van ride for those students, but you know, needing to look at families' plans for the fall, whether they're comfortable putting their students on um, the, the transportation and then you know, what implications that has fiscally for us once we receive the guidance. Okay, I'm also thinking about VOTEC, particularly some of those schools that our students attend that are farther distanced away. If we have to, I'll have, you know, if we had one bus before, maybe we have to have two or three. I don't know. So that could be a big money ticket potentially. Right, absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Aaron, Aaron, tied to that transportation, kind of following up with Suzanne's question, I mean, if if we have a lot of parents opting out of transport, are we having conversations currently with our transportation provider? I mean, have they given, you know, when we have a contract, you know, or, or 
how flexible is the contract? Let's say we don't, don't need half the fleet that we normally have. What? Sure. So, uh, you know, kind of two separate realms. Our, our big bus contract with First Student um, is negotiable in the sense that the number of buses that are used for transportation is at the discretion of the school committee. Um, again, larger conversations if we're talking about a fleet of 24 becoming a fleet of one or two because we're, in, you know, families are on accident transportation. As far as outside of Pembroke placements, we bid those routes every single year. Um, and so though we're in the beginning phases of putting together the placements that our students will be in, um, there's so much unknown around what the safety um, and sanitation guidelines will be that we have not awarded um, binding bids yet to those to those providers. It does say in all of our language that it's subject to um, the guidance from DESE and parent mm -hmm. choice on whether this they'll be sending their student on the on the van or, or whatnot. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want to move forward or do you want to go back to um, anything else you want to show here, Aaron? Do you want to go yeah, to Yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, showing you the line by line budget in this yeah. format is, is not, I think, productive. I did share it with you um, as yep. part of your packet. I'm happy to answer questions if you have them about that detail. Um, yeah. Open purchase orders, again, not something that necessarily lends itself to this right. conversation. It just kind of outlines where we were with that 472,000 number. So yep. um, I'm going to put the memo back up because I think that helps you guys. We do. We Yep. <laughs> we, we do because we need to so we need that in order to to make the motion because what, what we have the packet is not so if you could show that up thank you um so i'll entertain a motion to encumber the amount of one million nine hundred seventy four thousand $492.11 for fiscal year 21, returning to the town of Pembroke the amount of $12,012.08 for unspent purchase orders and payroll from fiscal year 19. So moved. Second. So motion by Susie, second by Suzanne. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, if there are questions from, the, from the, the public, feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll happily jump into those. Um, but let me do by roll call. Um, Suzanne? Su Suzanne? Uh, yes, can okay. you hear me? <laughs> yep, I got you there. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, I just David. had a power dimage where I'm at, so I may lose you, so. <laughs> That's okay. I got a power outage yesterday, so I understand how you feel. Okay, so Suzanne, yes. Uh, David? David, are you on mute? Pretty sure he's on, unless that was a... Oh. Got it, okay. He's having trouble, so he's going to only vote when he's needed for the vote, and he'll text if he has questions. So, uh, sorry, we're having all sorts of technical problems. So, Suzanne, yes. Um, Jim? That's a yes, Mike. Oh, great. Susie? Yes. And I'm yes. So, um, Natalie, for that, we'll show uh, four zero with David not voting. And he's, he would have voted yes, but obviously I can't convey his vote, unfortunately. But thank you, David. It still shows as unanimous. So, we're getting through this. Um, moving into, if there are, again, if there are questions on any of that, um, close out for this year, please just put it in the chat box and we will hit, hit it um, a point during the meeting. So, um, Aaron, you want to do a family, uh, a survey for family members that you're looking for us to waive our policy and um, vote so that it can be distributed this week. Sure. Um, so in your packet, uh, similar, it's the exact same survey I shared with you last week. Um, just a theory around um, waiving your policy of a first and a second read and just approving it as a first read, first read and approval for the family survey so that we can get it out tomorrow. Again, the survey, the purpose of the survey is to gauge families' preliminary thoughts and plans as we talk about, um, you know, what the initial guidance from DESC was for school reopening and how families are thinking about just that, you know, not, not releasing any of our potential plans, but just trying to gauge 
where families are on their uh, intent or not intent to return their students to school or to access transit seats. So, so obviously this will be used in conjunction with the working groups as well as all of the information that will be coming out over the next couple of weeks to start to give guidance within the three plans that you're going to talk about in a little bit, correct? Correct. Yeah. Any questions from the committee on the survey? Uh, yeah. What's the anticipated timeline that you're going to open it and how long you're going to keep it open? Um, so the plan is, is to send it out first thing in the morning. Um, I'd like to only keep it out for a few days. So I'd like to um, close it on Monday so that we can really use that information as part of some of the working group work that has started this week and will continue next week before we submit the plan. Okay. In just a week, a little less than a week. Okay. The other question is, um, is, is it going to be clear, to be, uh, you, I had mentioned this to you earlier, but is it going to be clear to people that if they, you know, might have a feeling, if they have multiple children in our school district, have a feeling one way on one child and a different way on another child, that they sure to get both of those thoughts and what their desires are by filling out two surveys? Sure. Um, in the email that goes out with the survey, we'll let families know that they can they can answer it multiple times for children that they feel differently about. I know some people have, feel one way about their high school student, but may feel differently about their kindergartner. So absolutely, we'll let, let families know um, through the body of the email what you know that they can they can access it for them. Um, okay. And one last thing is that under um, question four, when you're talking about the rotations and the split week rotation and the week and the do you, um, I, I'll be honest, I'm still a little confused. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's, like, if it's only me, that's fine. But if we just want to be clear that people aren't, we're not really at, that that's not the intent for it. It really, we're gauging other things. But I just want to make sure that those are very clear to people. And they don't be, they're not like, what? I don't understand what they just said. So um, I don't know. I don't have any suggestions on how to to change it, but I just want to maybe just have another set of eyes look at it and see if we just make it very clear to people what the, at least today on July 14th, what the three kind of options might look like. Sure. And those are just, they're not, that's not an exhaustive list of options. As you can imagine, even since we started putting that survey together last week, other potential um, hybrid models have come up in, in various districts. So it's really just about figuring out kind of, trying to get a gauge and you know, one of the, the main concerns out there is child care and, and families being able to you know work and not work and just trying to get a gauge on whether people are are more interested in um you know hybrid within the same week or alternating weeks or, or that type but um, if anyone has some language suggestion i'm happy to tighten it up so it's clearer to people because i think sometimes we know what we're looking for but it doesn't necessarily translate into what we're asking so right because you you're living it and breathing it every single day so mm -hmm. um if I come up with some great words, I'll share them with you, but I don't have any right now. But I um, wanted to point that out. Um, Aaron. Oops, Thank you. It looks good, though. Every other, I think it looks good. It's simple. It's, I think people can fill it out very rapidly. It shouldn't take too much of time out of their day. Um, and hopefully we'll get a good, good amount of people filling it out, and we'll get some data that will help guide us. Erin, just a thought, knowing last week you went through kind of in detail what some of those different scenarios would look like. Would it be possible when the, the survey is sent out to embed a link tied to those documents that might help if people wanted to dig in a little Absolutely. more? Absolutely. Yep. We did the same thing with the staff survey that we sent out earlier this week as we linked the DESE um, models to it. So, absolutely. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, Aaron, on that, uh, talk about the link. Do you want to just real quick before we go uh, much further on this or before we take a vote on this, do you want to talk about the, the page that has been added to the website? Sure. So we added a um, reopening of school tab to the website where we'll place, um, you know, all of the documents that we receive from DESC as well as any um, items that are generated internally. So I'll, we'll post again. For example, a copy of this survey, a copy of the staff survey that we sent out so that people can just click on one place to get everything. And, and as the working groups meet and we get some drafts of plans and templates together, we'll post all of that there as well. Yeah. Just to make it a little bit easier to navigate through. Um, 
So are there other questions in the survey? And, and then uh, Sandy, we'll get to your question in the box um, on Medicaid in one second. Are there any other questions in the survey? Okay, um, Suzanne, do you know what policy we're waiving for this off the top of your head? Uh, no, <laughs> I, and I, I figured I'd try because sometimes you do. Well, wait, um, and I was going to look it up, but the storms <laughs> where I'm at, I don't have internet, which is why I'm calling in. So I uh, no worries. Look. So maybe someone could help me who has some internet <laughs> access. Um, B. D E, oh. I'm gonna guess. B it's B G B from Natalie. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> she she beat us to it. Thank you, Natalie. We 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 take that as I, we're pretty sure you're right. Uh, but that, Suzanne, usually you do now. So okay, is there a motion to waive policy B G B and approve the parent? Sh I'm sorry, the family survey for school reopening for the school year of 2021. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Suzanne, second by Sue. Sue, Susie, sorry. Um, okay. So by roll call, Suzanne? Yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. Susie? Yes. I'll check to see if David comes off mute or can. Okay, we'll pass on that, and I'm yes. So again, we'll show it to 401. So that does pass, that will be distributed. Is that gonna go out tomorrow, you think, Aaron, or you think it'll go out on Thursday? Nope, the plan is to send it out tomorrow morning. Perfect, okay. Before we move into the next section, which we start to get, or you're gonna do um, the Bryanville principal search. Um, Sandy Beaton has a question, and maybe you could answer this in an update from the last one. Um, the That um, regard, Nursing and such has Medicaid reimbursement helped offset special education costs at all. Is impossible for parents with commercial insurance in Mass Health is secondary due to the child's disability. Make them eligible for Mass Health to reimburse nursing if the school covers parent yearly deductibles, two deductibles, more costly. Sorry, I'm just getting something across my PC. Oh shoot! Um, sorry. Two deductibles more cost effective than year round school nursing. So, Aaron, we, we talk a, a little bit about because we've talked about the Medicaid reimbursement. That's a parent consent for us to file for reimbursement. You want to talk about where we are on doing that reimbursement, how much we can, and, um, you know, in the context of Sandy's question. And if you could also, an update from a question she asked the last time, do um, you have an idea of how many people have not asked for reimbursement on the um, transportation cost? Sure. So happy to do the first part, right the second. Um, so Medicaid reimbursement, again, is, is, a, is a parental consent. Consent You cannot use passive consent. So we talked about this, I think, in January when we had the Board of Selectmen um, with us at our school committee meeting. We get about sixty-five to 80000 in Medicaid reimbursement each year. That goes directly to the town. It does not come to the schools. Um, in years past, we have worked with the town on expenses that benefit both the town and the school, one of those being being um, maybe 10 years ago or so, we used to share a facilities position with the town. Some of that um, funding came out of Medicaid reimbursement. At this point, um, our Medicaid reimbursement that goes to the town is used to offset our unemployment costs associated with school employees. So um, I think that's the first part. The second part, as far as um, families' health insurance and how that plays in, I know that Justice here too. My understanding is that um, that does not cover school day nursing um, for families. I think Jess, if you want to pipe in. I'm yep. Here for sure. Here. Sure, I'm here. Um, yes, I'm not aware that we can um, request through, through Medicaid any reimbursement for parents um, in regards to deductibles. Um, and the reason why we, uh, I think Sandy's asking also about employing kind of um, when families employ nurses and then they work for um, us through parent insurance um, and that um, we don't follow that model. I know some collaboratives do, um, but that isn't something with liabilities. We are, um, we hire our own nurses as they work for us or we work through an agency. So I believe that was the question about the second part. Great, thank you. And Aaron, you want to 
give an update on, I know Cassini asked uh, a couple minutes ago about the reimbursement for an update on where we are um, on transportation reimbursement requests? Sure. So again, um, families have until um, the end of July to notify us on whether or not they are interested in a reimbursement. At this point, we have processed reimbursements for 222 families, so less than half of, of the families have requested reimbursement. So off the top of my head, I don't know the exact dollar amount, but for your next meeting, um, and I assume by the time you meet next, that window will have closed. I'll supply you the exact dollar amount. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, if there are other questions, again, please just drop them in the chat box. Happy to answer them at any point. Um, I try to, I, anything regarding money, I do remember. So I'll just throw that out there. Um, Erin, we want to move on to the, um, we're, Sorry, I'm going off of two agendas. I'm going off the Ryan Hill principal search. Absolutely. principal search. I thought that's where you were going. <laughs> um, so just to talk a little bit about the process, um, we posted for the position of um, Brianville principal in the middle of April, um, understanding that we are in a much different time as a, when it comes to posting and hiring of positions. So we did receive um, several qualified applicants for the role. Um, we scheduled interviews for seven applicants and we were able to interview four. Um, the other three had kind of found their way to different pools or made different um, employment decisions prior to us setting up an interview. So we were fortunate to have um, members of the Brightville staff as well as a couple of parents and some and um, Bess and Donna um, serve as our search committee for that role. Uh, there was a lot of feedback about all of the candidates that they interviewed. Um, but at the end of the day, the sentiment of the group is really that we want to make sure that we are hiring the next forever principal of science. Dr. Glott is, is leaving very big shoes for somebody to fill. Um, and, you know, a, a function, again, of where we're at, we want to make sure that um, we open ourselves up to a really deep pool as opposed to a shallow puddle. Um, again, so we did have qualified applicants, but there were not very many. We did not we did not put in front of the search committee, um, you know, several sitting principals with years of experience that just wasn't available to us uh, um, to interview. So I have made the decision to not move forward anybody from that first round of interviews to a second round. Um, I've decided to appoint an interim principal of Bryantville for the school year um, 2021 in hopes that in a few months, we'll have a better idea of what the landscape of education will look like moving forward um, and be able to repost and, and you know, attract a, a potentially larger pool. Um, but if not, we've you know, spoken with, with those candidates that were in our pool um, that we'd like to continue to <clears throat> have as viable options if possible. Um, at the same time, you know, just thinking about the reasons behind the interim appointment, it's really about putting somebody in a place for success. And the pool that we were faced with would be um, primarily first time building principles. So some of them do have some assistant principal experience. It's really first time building principles. And I'm not sure that this environment or what we're about to embark on as far as return to school in the fall really sets somebody up for success. The, the number one function of a building administrator is really the relationship piece, not only with students, but with staff and with families. And that doesn't necessarily um, work as seamlessly in this type of platform. So, you know, really thinking about wanting whomever we select to be the most successful um, in, in, you know, somebody that's identified being a principal as their next step career-wise, we do want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support them and set them up for success. So another reason to kind of prolong it a little bit longer. Um, with that being said, you know, taking a look at the amazing talent that we have within the district, you know, who could really seamlessly migrate into the the threat of Bryant Villa and you know really complement the assets and skill set of the staff and the administration that's already in place there. There was no choice easier to make than Dr. Mark Galligan. So our current humanities K through 12 content supervisor, um, Dr. Galligan has been with us for 10 years um, before coming, I mean, sorry, five years. He's been in, in administration for over 10 years. And before that, he's taught anywhere from fourth through 12th grade. Um, so he's really defined himself here in Pembroke as a curriculum leader. Um, that's, you know, a very similar skill set to what Dr. Glaude possessed at Bryant Phil. Um, at the same time, he has proven time and time again, his ability to navigate difficult situations with staff and with families. Um, and, you know, we're really fortunate that he is willing um, to fill that role for us for this coming school year. You know, taking a look at you know, Michelle Ahrens, our current assistant principal at Bryanville, has a very strong special education and behavioral management background. 
you know, really thinking about how their two skill sets really sync up nicely to provide a great support um, for students, staff, and families at Bryantville. So I am appointing Dr. Gallion as the principal for next year with the understanding that our intent is, is to repost for the ever for the forever principal of Bryantville once we have a better idea of, you know, where education is going. And, and the timeline for that, we're hoping to be somewhere in the latter part of November to get a posting up um, and, and start to really um, interview candidates moving forward. Happy to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> well, first of all, I see Mark on the call tonight. So congratulations um, and thank you. Um, I know you're going to do a, a great job. Um, everything, you know, you've done so far in the five years, I thought it was longer than five, didn't think it was 10, um, has been great. And we appreciate you taking that role, um, you know, in, in filling the, the, again, the shoes that Dr. Gloud leaves. Um, so great. Anything from anyone else? Um, if I could just, this is Mark Galligan, if I could just say real quick to um, Superintendent Obi and to the school committee and to everyone listening in the community, I just want to say thank you um, for placing your trust in me. And um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to work with more closely with the Bryantville teachers than I have in the past and also to really become a member of a deeper member of an exceptional learning community. So thank you everyone. I am looking forward to the challenges and the opportunities that we will definitely meet with success this year. So thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Suzanne, anything? Good. No, just thanks for, you know, really thinking that through, Aaron, and, and coming up with what seems to be a really good plan. Thank you, and welcome to a different role. <laughs> Great. David, I'm not sure if you can get off of you. Okay. Uh, Jim, anything? No, uh, just to say, Mark, congratulations. Um, we're here to help. We're here to listen. So please don't be a stranger. We'll look forward to seeing you at, uh, at upcoming meetings. Great. Great. Susie, anything? No, I think the rest of the uh, committee has already said it, but thank you. Yep, great. And Aaron, um, I don't think this is where you're going next, but good timing. Uh, Maureen Dorito asked how we were placing Mr. Galligan's position. So you want to talk about the, the plan around that? Sure. Nice segue. Um, so as we talked about during the budget process this past spring into May and June, um, you know, our intent administratively moving forward was to function with one less administrator in the district. Um, you know, at the time, the position that we had identified was the director of athletics and facilities because it was vacant. Um, at this time, my recommendation to the committee would be to fill the director of facilities and athletics. Um, and not fill Dr. Not backfill Dr. Galligan's position of humanities coordinator K through 12. Understanding that obviously there's still a significant amount of work associated with that role. Um, you know, Mark will continue to be instrumental in humanities K through six. Um, and then we would look at seven through 12, some of the um, supervision, well, really the evaluation on um, pieces of, of the staff going back to the building administrators both at the middle school at the high school in the high school as well as you know some of the curricular work going back to the, the building level and so in, in talking with Mary Beth um, and knowing how organized and structured Dr. Galligan has been we're definitely in a place where we could go with the year without filling that role and not take any steps backwards so I'm definitely able to maintain the systems and structures that he's put in place as well as still you know potentially move forward on some of the pieces that you've heard Mark talk about in particular at school committee including some of the civics work that we have facing us coming this fall um all of that is, is in a great place to continue um to move forward so my recommendation to the committee would be that we host that we post for the director of facilities and athletics and not backfill the director uh, i mean the pre-k the k through 12 humanities coordinator position so Aaron, Aaron, if you post, what type of pool do you expect to get? And do you expect that person to be more heavier on athletics or heavier on facilities? It would be super helpful if they were heavy on facilities, but having posted twice for athletic director in my 10 years here, I'm pretty sure that um, the pool is generally heavy on the athletics end. Um, so, you know, obviously as we've 
done in the past, happy to work with somebody to bring them up to speed on the facilities piece, um, but would be helpful to have just, just somebody in their role as we start talking about return to school, the operational challenges that we'll be facing as far as facilities um, and, and safeties and precautions. So definitely helpful to have another integral member of that team during this work. Um, I can see the question in the chat box from Sue Bollinger yeah. that's asked, can you explain why AD and facilities are combined? Um, so that was a budget reduction four, six, six years ago. It, it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was the year that Justin joined. So no, it. Um, well, it, I thought it was because it, that I was it the year Justin joined, or was it the year before? No, so the year before we had before um, Brian Fitzgibbon. So I think it's been. Oh, five that's right, Brian. Years. Okay. <laughs> it's been Jeez. kind of all over the place, um, but it was all a budget right. reduction several years ago. Um, just you know, taking into account the fact that the facilities role when the district first separated from Silver Lake was a much larger, um, more of a, a structural civil engineering type role as we were embarking on large. Um, remodeling and renovation projects in all five buildings. That work kind of, as you can imagine, dried up in a sense that the projects were completed. Um, the, the role then started to shift more towards day-to-day -to -day custodial supervision operations and maintenance. Um, we had somebody in that position, so it was a buildings and grounds manager for a couple of years, um, and then we made that reduction, um, I think five years ago at this point, and combined the two. So. So again, we recognize that it is a huge role. Um, we are There's a couple of other school systems on the South Shore that pair athletics with something. In some instances, yeah. they're an assistant principal. Sometimes they're a PE um, department head. Here in Pembroke, the pairing is just facilities. It's not necessarily um, a very natural pairing, but there are a few um, similar roles on the South Shore and in, in, in the state. Okay, questions from the committee on this? Suzanne? Sorry. Um, That's okay. No. Um, no. Not. Not. None. Thanks. Okay. Uh, David, if you can get off mute. Okay. Let's go to Jim. No, Mike. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sue. Oh, Susie. Sorry. Um. Just. I, I guess because we said we're positioned pretty well. Um, the planning for the fall season for athletics has already kind of been in position. And that, I, I guess it's, is it safe to assume that's to also help whoever may get this position to spend more time on if they're not up to speed as far as they'd like to be for the facilities management? To Correct. And so this, this you know, uh, environment that the fall is thinking up to be would be right? Um, drinking from a fire hose, right? No, there, there's no more important time to have somebody getting up to speed in, in facilities as, as the fall we're about to embark on. Um, so yes, a lot of the planning, as I mentioned before, for fall athletics, if there is a season for all of the traditional fall sports, has already been um, really planned out and mapped out in addition to a, a lot of the pieces for winter. So it does allow the, this new person a, a pretty good chunk of time to get really um, Integrally, inter, integrally, whatever. Integrally involved. Integrated. <laughs> yeah, sure. All of those words, and then some. Thirteen hours later, um, <laughs> in our facilities, and be a part of the plan. So I, I really feel like the best way to learn our buildings, learn our, and our, learn our structures and our procedures is to really walk them and be a part of them. And as we're talking about really rethinking, bringing people into our buildings, this would be a great time to learn. Great. Okay. So there are great. a couple questions. There are a couple of questions in in the chat box. So, first one, um, Erin uh, from Limbido, where are we with the reading specialist positions? So, um, definitely a different conversation, but um, we have posted all of our um, vacancies as anticipated openings for the fall. Again, that is the right um, business practice when we're operating off a of one twelfth budget without Chapter seventy numbers. So. Um, we have received applications. I know that Mike and um, Erica have begun looking at applicants and are starting to interview this week. And I know Dr. Galligan will be joining them now that he has um, been formally appointed. So they are interviewing candidates and, and hope to have that wrapped up um, the week of August 3rd. Um, so, you know, again, moving forward on all of our anticipated vacancies until the state tells us financially otherwise. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so if... 
So two, uh, two other questions uh, from Subalinger again. So why not keep facilities separate and hire an AD? A lot of it comes down to, you know, I know we made the budget reduction, I guess, six years ago. But at that point, there was a concern. Uh, athletics was actually, was even athletics a full-time position when we made the switch? I thought it also had a dean of students. So Correct. So athletics, so yeah. Proceeding athletics, that was a dean of students. Yeah, the athletic athletic director job has not been full time for many years now. I would think it goes back at least seven or eight, where it became a part time position, and we you know had different positions on the facility. So that's the big reason why we're not hiring a full time in either position now at this point. Correct. Right. Would so yes, the, the full time athletic director was ten years ago. Here, that was the last time we had a full time athletic director. So yeah. Um, so the uh, question from uh, Penelope Hannon, if high school athletics follow collegiate, collegiate athletics and don't happen, is the facilities a full-time position? Well, there's a couple things on that. Just for those of you who haven't followed, uh, two college conferences, both of them local, the Ivy League and the NESCAC, uh, New England Small College Athletic conference um, have canceled fall athletics. There's questions going on both at the state level and even national about flip-flopping seasons, um, you know, depending upon who you who you look at, right? The NCAA, the MIA, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, just so people are aware, nothing has been determined, especially locally. If you go to the governor's guidance right now, um, you can practice in all sports. You cannot play any type of context contest for level three sports which um is football football soccer hockey wrestling or to name a few just to give everybody some context on that one so aaron you would still need something in athletics even if we didn't have a fall season because they would be planning at that point for spring but they would right, still there be, would be a, more there'd be a significant amount of logistics that yeah. would need to happen, especially if the seasons were to flip or if we were to be offering more options in the spring, given, you know, how the phasing works and, and loosened up. So, um, you know, though, I think if, you know, Justin were joining us or anyone that had previously been in this role will tell you it's kind of cyclical. So there's weeks where the 40 hours or so are uh, devoted to athletics and following week, it could be 40 hours of facilities. It does migrate pretty seamlessly between those two um, topics. But again, if, if there were not athletics in the fall, it would be heavier on the facilities role. But that, in my mind, would mean in the spring, it would be heavier on the athletics role and vice versa. So, 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 the, so the thought here is, um, we can cover the, um, you know, Dr. Galligan's role through other administrators in the district. And the feeling is by hiring an a, a athletic director, facilities manager, one or both of those areas will be significant that we need help in for the fall. Is that, is that, did I, did I capture the, the thinking behind that? Yep, absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, another question, and I don't know if we have the answer for this. I think we do have a ballpark answer at this point. Um, Erica Rosini is asking, "What is the budget savings for uh, for the sports that will not play in the fall? It, how much is the maximum it could be? Because there's still a thought at, that some sports, cross country, that traditionally runs in the fall, um, could still run. Soccer could could run based upon where the guidance is from the Commonwealth today." Um, again, on June 14th, quoting Sue from earlier, um, with the information we have. So, Erica, what's the, if we had no fall sports, what would be the save? Uh, with no fall sports, um, understanding that, you know, supplies and whatnot have already been ordered as we sure, anticipate yeah. the potential. Um, you know, the savings would be associated with coaching salaries, transportation, and athletic officials for the fall. So, that would, you know, be anywhere um, around, I would say around 200,000 when you talk about, um, the salaries of the coach, the stipends of the coaches and the athletic officials in particular, the transportation savings. Um, again, you know, we try to use our buses as much as we possibly can. Um, those employees that, that, you know, drive our bus are full-time custodians for us, but if there was no bus driving for them, then they, they wouldn't be overtime. So there's not a huge save necessarily on our internal bus driving, but again, would save us from outsourcing any of the runs to first students. So I would guess around $200,000 for that number. Yeah, great. Yeah, and still more to come because, um, I, 
you know, there's potential for everything from not having them to swapping to lots of things that are in play right now that we're hearing about or are rumored. So I think we, we would have, there's still some time before that's decided, right? Because we would start football. Football starts earlier yeah. than the other sports, right? Yeah, it's usually the third week of August or so. Um, you know, the call that I was on earlier today led us to believe we could have an answer on sports as early as the end of next week. So, yeah. Yeah, so still lots to come, and even there's some confusion on what's being offered and what's not. So, oh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, football and cheer start on 821. I know it's late start to school this year, and football and, um, and cheer start earlier than the other sports start, I think, a week later now. There was a change a couple of years ago by the MIA. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are other questions, again, please keep them coming. Um, Aaron, you want to continue on the reopening update? Or is anything else? Can can I just oh, say sure. something Sorry. while we're on athletics rather than Absolutely. circling back at the very end of the meeting? Um, I, you know, opening school has its own set of measures, and you know, putting kids back in sports is a, is a whole other beast almost. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm hoping that we get some some decent guidance and not too open ended guidance because these are going to be, you know hard decisions and, and we need to keep everybody safe. Um, so uh, it's just a comment. It's not a question. Um, it's just a thought that's going through my head now. And um, I hope the guidance comes um, sooner rather than later. And it has um, some tangible, you know, things in it that we can actually, you know, act upon. That's all. You. <laughs> No, I hope it's not guidance and is more of a directive because what they came out with last Tuesday, a week ago today actually, um, wasn't very clear and left a lot up to interpretation. Um, so there are different ways it's being interpreted across and the stuff going on over the summer um, does involve high school level athletes who are getting ready preseason type stuff, um, you know, with summer sports, baseball, soccer. I know. So it's just kind of a, it's, well, you know, unfortunately, when when we need need more than guidance. So we'll see what happens. But good point. Okay. Excellent point. Any other comments on this part? part? I know we kind of went from Bryanville principal into the reopening. And you want to continue on that, Aaron? Yes, I do. So right. I figured you did. <laughs> Sorry, delay. Um, in your packets, I had shared with you just the, the um, communication that came out from Commissioner Riley on Friday. Um, and just want to talk a little bit about where we are in our process and what that memo on Friday kind of changes or doesn't change for us moving forward. So um, the memo on Friday outlined the um, expectation for the three plans. So you remember at the last meeting, I, I spent a pretty significant amount of time talking you through the, what the three plans were. So just kind of quickly, the first plan is to bring 100% of students back um, for in-person learning in the fall. The second plan is a hybrid model. So where half or some makeup of the students would learn remotely while others were learning in person and then those cohorts would flip. And then the third model would be to have all students, so 100% of students learning remotely. Um, they gave us, originally when, we, when they started talking about the plan, said that they would be due in the middle of August. Surprise, surprise, the plans are due Friday, July 31st to the state. Um, now, this is just a skeletal plan. They um, anticipate releasing a template either tomorrow or the next day um, and not looking for a ton of information, just a skeletal plan again around those three distinct plans, um, but not asking for anybody to make a decision um, on which plan they're starting in. So when this conversation first started, it was made very clear that the state would decide what which plan um, schools in Massachusetts would start in, and as you can imagine, as is par for the course, that has changed slightly, and it sounds as though there has, there's no written documentation of this. It sounds as though um, individual cities and towns will be able to make the determination of which plan to start in, which makes the most sense for their community at the time. So we are just submitting plans on the 31st. Um, you, I would recommend um, that you all vote or have a robust conversation about the three plans, about Pembroke as a community. Um, you know, I'll share with you some of the health data that we have at the time, and then at that point, start having our conversation about what makes the most sense for us as a community. Probably in the beginning part of August, I would 
you know, recommend that we give families enough time to kind of react to our stance and then make the, the plan that's right for their families. Um, but there's no need to have any of that conversation prior to July 31st. Um, we have started our working group. So at our last meeting, I shared with you kind of the makeup of how we were thinking about the work. Um, so the curriculum and instruction group and all of its 800 members met on Monday evening. Um, Jessica's student services group, um, special education met today. The social emotional work group is meeting tomorrow and facilities is meeting tomorrow evening. Um, so we're starting to work through some of the things that worked really well, things that didn't necessarily work in the spring that we wanna improve upon and really kind of aligning our expectations. So those working groups are made up of um, administrators, faculty and parents. So it's great to have all three viewpoints kind of at the table at the same time. Um, our hope is to get some preliminary information from all of those working groups by the end of this week so that we can bring together that district-wide committee that I talked about last week to kind of weigh in on, on where we are with the work so far um, and, you know, maybe make some suggestions on areas they think might be important to kind of highlight before we start to put them into the, the template of the plan. So um, there is no new information at this point. They have not released the guidance on transportation. We're expecting to get that this week. They have not released the template yet. Um, all that they have given us is the indication that cities and towns will make the decision that school committees and, and superintendents will make the decisions that are right for their community at the time. Um, the one piece I think it's important to highlight is at this point, the guidance is that all schools in your district are in the same plan. So you, we wouldn't be opening the high school in a remote plan and Brian Phil in an in-person plan. They're asking that you keep all of your schools in the same plan, understanding that uh, a, a remote day might look different for a high school student than it does from an elementary school student, but that, you know, the designation of plan one, plan two, and plan three, that you are keeping your whole district in the same plan um, at the same time. Um, I think other than that, we're just waiting for more guidance. You know, there was some really great conversation um, yesterday during the instruction group. I know that Jess had some really good conversation today with her group. Um, you know, facilities is my group, and I expect I expect great conversation, but I expect different conversations. So there's not a lot of um, work that happens in the, the facilities group for 100% remote learning, um, but a lot of our work is around what does it look, look like to bring students and staff back from a safety perspective, from a, a facilities perspective, and whatnot. So different conversation, but still good conversation. So that work is happening, um, you know, in that timeline that we had shared, that I had shared last week, we've talked about kind of some check-in points with staff and with the community. So next week we'll be offering, um, you know, a kind of town hall-like forum for um, families at some point, as well as staff so that they can ask questions as we work our way through the plans. Because it is, the more eyes and ears that you have on these things, the better chance you have of kind of, um, you know, preemptively answering potential questions, so. That is where we are at. I'm happy to answer any questions you have with the caveat that I have no answers, but I'm happy to try to answer them for you. I have two questions. Go ahead. Well, well then um, Sue, your limit is two. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, I'll keep it at two. Um, is there any guidance for, uh, about like, what if you open in one fashion and then Something changes in your town, um, either, you know, the community or the health, by the health or, or whatever. Is there, <clears throat> are they allowing for you to adjust one way or the another to maybe go to a different plan? Or whatever you do on September 1st, I'm just making that date up, um, you got to stick with it. No, but it's absolutely meant to be a continuum. The thought process is that many communities would kind of migrate between in-person, remote, fully remote, hybrid, throughout the fall, depending on what health data in their town looks like. Um, and so there is potentially, I would expect, some sort of guidance on, you know, what what are those tipping points where you should be taking a look at, you know, what, what incident percentage does a town need to have where you should be thinking about closing and going to full remote and whatnot. So that'll be some of the conversations that we have in the facilities group as well as the district-wide group, because the, the real driver on that type of distinction would really be information from the Board of Health. Um, right. So, Okay. And the second part is, um, you know, are, are they, I mean, the, the way you run an elementary school and the way you run a high school are so different. Um, are, are they, you know, are even recognizing that and providing guidance on, you know, just because they're just different, different ways of running a school and it's, it's just very different. Sounds like they're saying it's up. We're a school district case for 12 and 
treating it all the same, but there are several nuances. Are they providing guidance on that other than no masks, K-1-2, you know, kind of stuff? So just to pick up on your last point, so the guidance says masks for students in grades 2 through 12. That does not mean that our plan here in Pembroke would be only masking students in grades 2 through 12. There's obviously an argument out there to mask all students, understanding that that looks different. But again, that's part of kind of the conversations that we're having in the working groups. Um, yes, there is some recognition that buildings are run differently. You know, a lot of or the only guidance that really is out there right now is limiting the movement of students in a building during the day. That's a much easier task at the elementary level than it is at the secondary level when you're talking about you know, the wide offerings of electives that students have, the fact that, you know, the way our high school is set up, they're really wings, so the English wing, the history wing, the math wing, the science wing, and needing to think differently about kind of potentially moving teachers and classrooms around so that students are traveling less and traversing the building less to limit exposure. But um, there is not really any guidance out there at this point. I expect um, when we see the template that it'll be pretty bare bones and they're really just wanting us to articulate whether or not we can bring students back with the three feet minimum that they're asking for, um, you know, what a day would look like in a remote learning environment for students and families, understanding that the guidance that we've received has been around really more robust attendance policies, looking at actual grading as opposed to the credit, no credit environment that we were in the spring, and then the hybrid model, you know, what are you thinking as far as bringing kids in? Um, what is your cohort model? Is it every other day? Is it, you know, morning, afternoon? Is it every other week? Um, just to highlight that piece in particular, um, you know, the South Shore superintendents have been working as a region to think about the hybrid plan. We do share a lot of the workforce as far as parents and whatnot. So it behooves us to kind of, to kind of try to sync up as much as possible on a hybrid plan um, for families. And that was uh, a topic of conversation earlier um, earlier today with that group. So there is an appetite to do that on the South Shore, similar to when we came to you and talked about closing school ahead of the governor, we decided to make a, a regional decision to do that. And I do think it makes sense to really work as a region, um, you know, especially on, on the hybrid plan. So. Okay, well, I do have one other question, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it came up. Um, you know, it's, it's, I find that really interesting because, you know, you look at the country and you look at, you know, Massachusetts and its leadership was such a leader in reopening in phases and keeping people safe and staying away from another spike and, and all that, um, you know, to, to not get as, as solid of guidance from the education department is, is a little disheartening, but I'm wondering is... Um, is there another state, you know, that has maybe done that? Maybe they've, you know, they hit the mark in the schools and they have some really good ideas that, you know, obviously still staying within all the guidelines and whatnot of Massachusetts, that we could take a page out of their book and, or even another country, mind you, um, you know, to help, to help us, you know, what, what's been working, what's been not. I mean, I'm sure you guys are thinking about that. I'm sure that's up, but it's just, um, it's just a thought that I had, you know. Somebody yeah, so else. I think, um, yeah. unfortunately, a lot of the school systems that ha are as have had such a great handle on keeping the cases low, like Massachusetts, so New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, are on similar school year cycles as us. So they don't necessarily, unlike the South, where kids typically go back to school a little bit earlier, we're obviously going to have the opportunity to see what it looks like there because they start school you know, in the earlier part of August, um, you know, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont are all on a similar structure as us. They're asking for three plans, um, you know, in, in how you migrate between those three. So um, we're kind of all in this boat together, at least in the Northeast. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so Aaron, David did have a question um, they texted over about, do we have the final say, meaning the school committee, or is it the selectmen and the Board of Health? So w really what it comes down to, Aaron, is is we will get DSE guidance, and then it is a school district decision. However, we're going to work with the Board of Health on it. Uh, we wouldn't do anything um, you know, opposed to what Lisa Cullity, and that's who you're working with, the health agent, on what we think is is safe. Is that is that accurate? Right. So, um, you know, again, there's no written documentation yet. My assumption is that it'll be worded that it's the recommendation of the superintendent to the school committee to 
which plan we start in, um, understanding that we're the ones that are kind of boots on the ground with yeah. the stakeholders here. Uh, at the same time, obviously, the Board of Health is the one that monitors what, what our plans look like and what the safety protocols are. And, you know, our intent all along has been to include Lisa in those conversations. So um, yeah. though it's your call, it would be an informed call that you're making with the information that I provide to you as well as the Board of Health. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for those of you who follow um, the Mass Association of School Committees, their list serve. there's been a lot of discussion about whose call is it? Uh, does the school committee vote on the plan to reopen and, and the such. Um, so it, it clearly has to be a, a joint decision and I would strongly make sure um, we consider making it unanimous because it's not something we would want to go in split, first of all. And second of all, um, it's not something that we're going to, I think, go off, you know, and do our own thing. Uh, clearly, we're going to look at what's happening around us. Uh, we're going to look at what ha what's happening within us, and we're going to have to. We're taking into consideration all of the um, information that's coming in, as well as you know, in, in included that is the surveys from the staff and the parents. Those are all factors that come into play, and you know, I think things change. You know. They don't change maybe as much in Massachusetts daily. Hopefully they don't, or if they do change, hopefully they change even to the better. But um, it's going to be a decision that we're going to have to take everything into account when we go to make it. So it's not going to be an easy one, but we're going to have to. We want we will do what's what's right um, and not rush just because we feel you know it's the thing to do. It's not that we're right. And Aaron, you're in communication with all of your peers to correct. Yep, right. We're all in the same place right now. Yeah, yeah. It's not so. And nobody ever would have thought when we started here in March that we would be still talking about it. I think it, in March this was not in anticipation of a uh, J July fourteenth meeting. So, anyway, okay, Jim, did you have anything you want to add or ask? No, thanks, Mike. Okay, Susie. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Sure. I know when, when I've read some of these documents that have come out and, and the guidelines and then the discussions, especially in particular to the sports and what sports can practice and what sports can't, it got me to thinking about the things that relate to some of the sports. And in particular in the fall, the marching band, um, the cheerleading squad, um, you know, even the choral groups, a lot of these groups, are they, they compete later in the year. And if, if we can social distance practice, I mean, we've got band camp coming up in August. So it's right around the corner. Has there been any discussion, Aaron, at the state level or during, during your um, regular meetings with the other superintendents on, on what's happening with that? Sure. So um, there's a couple of different animals in that group that you've outlined. Um, so band camp in particular, there's no um, ability under phase three guidelines to bring the number of students together that we bring together for band camp, even outside. So um, phase three, step one does not allow outside gatherings of more than a hundred, understanding that there's special um, dispensation for town meeting and graduation. Those are the only two carve outs of the phase, phase three guidelines. Um, having had the ability to have a conversation um, preliminarily with Gwen earlier in the week um, and following up just kind of with Gwen Austin and, and Greg hopefully um, Thursday of this week, there was a study released from Colorado last night that shows that there's some potential for a traditional band-like structure in the school day, you know, recommending that you know students are playing outside as much as possible. There's some coverings that you can buy for some of the wind instruments. So that information is just recently coming out. So um, you know, the, I know that band camp is, is a big thing for families and planning and, and accommodating for that. So um, at this point, I'm you know not sure that band the traditional band camp that we've run in the past is what we'll be running in the future. Um, I, <clears throat> that time is spent um, on the actual marching part and the formations, and students would still need to be six feet apart even though we're outside. So, um, in talking with Gwen earlier today, I think our hope is to um, kind of get together internally over the next week or so and, and make a recommendation um, for a final decision going into the latter part of the week. So, um, that information is happening pretty smoothly. Um, but again, if, we, if the seasons switch and football becomes a spring sport, um, which is just kind of weird to think about, um, but you know that would 
that timeline would link itself link ourselves up to maybe doing something a little bit less traditional as far as the band camp moving to the spring when we're talking about I'd expect the competition timeline to also change a little bit when we're talking about some STEM for pieces as well as from watching band our Susie, anything else? Um, so I, I guess, well, I guess it, it, it was answered in that we can't get the large group. And I guess we'll find out if we could even do it where it was, you know, smaller portions with, within segments of that pretty large population. Right, that's, that's what Gwen and I talked about a little bit today, um, you know, having um, brass and percussion rehearse at separate times, you know, that, that kind of stuff and thinking through how we could put something together. Um, with the guidance that's in place right now. Okay, and and I know Gwen's very good about communicating with the Papa groups. Um, so you know, and the, the choral pieces, I'm, I'd be interested to see how this this goes. Um, and I guess the timing of when they let us know. But thank you, thank you. Great. So, and want to uh, go through some of the questions that are in the in the box uh, in, in the chat box real quick. So, Kate Nugent, uh, why not post for a facilities manager and train them in athletics? Seems like facilities will be a major focus given the circumstances. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I was hoping so. so. Um, you know, there's different implications for retirement and pension systems based off of way a job is posted or not posted. So if we posted um, traditionally for a straight facility manager that would fall under Plymouth County pension, oftentimes the athletic role um, has some PE department responsibilities or other responsibilities as you as you heard us talk about, but then have them fall under the MTRS um, job classification. So that's a piece of, of the thinking um, as well as really where we are with our buildings and our preventative maintenance. You know, on the front end of this year, it seems as though it's going to be heavy in facilities, but if, you know, talking with Justin and Brian and other people that have filled the role in the past, the bulk of the role is athletics in a, in a regular school year. So, um, you know, not wanting to, to, you know, make a hire this year that sets us up in a, in a bad place moving into what we hope to be a traditional or more normal school year is moving forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, Maureen Dorito actually dropped in about MIA is waiting for the state before making any decision regarding high school. They consider high school different from youth. I guess the two things I would add on that is the guidance that came out last week were just amateur versus professional. So they're treating that, which is why if you've seen the news, the college base, one of the college baseball leagues that wasn't canceled, the Futures League is running, um, but they treat the, the, those 22 year olds the same way they treat the 16, 17 year olds that I work with the same as a 10 year old. So the guidance wasn't great and the guidance did not use their subcommittee. I'll just say that and I'll kind of move on, which is really frustrating, but anyway, sorry. Um, so from Sarah McDonald, yes, I do remember the name. Um, have to say that working group has been great. I'm on the curriculum group and we had a really productive discussion. Really appreciate the chance to be on as a parent. Kudos to the teachers who have been fantastic and so hardworking. So thank you, Sarah and John Hannon. Um, oh, thank you, Maureen. I'm glad I'll take a look at that MIA statement. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure we get that on our reopening um, site. So thank you so much for putting that out there. Uh, from John Hannon, may have missed it, but it, but does the survey go out tomorrow, ask parents to weigh in on their current comfort level with the three, each of the three return to school options? And that's a yes. Um, so in the survey will be out tomorrow. Um, so and we'll make sure, obviously, if you don't see it, please reach out. We'll make sure you, you get it. But you should get it as part of the school community. Um, right. And it has the caveat that, you know, with the information we have right now, what are yes. you like? How do you feel about hybrid, in person or remote? So, um, again, as more information becomes available, I would anticipate needing to survey families again to get updated sentiment about where we're at. Great. Okay, so um, Heather Smiley with two questions. Uh, with full understanding that the plans for next year are currently in the pro in the process uh, for the three pronged approach, what is the procedure for uh, students and parents that are not comfortable with going back? So, Aaron, if we go to a hundred percent in in class, or if we if go to the hybrid what if a child does not want to come parent does not want to send their child back or uh, we have a child with pre-existing conditions something like that 
Sure. So the expectation for families that will not be returning to school, regardless of the model we're in, is that we provide a, a remote learning opportunity for them. Um, so we talked a little bit last week around, you know, there's definitely off the shelf products for K through 12 curriculum um, that you can purchase and, you know, buy seats in and looking at what those options are versus, um, you know, what it looks like for our teachers to provide a full remote environment for students, even when we have some sort of in-person or, or full in-person. So, you know, managing our workforce spread over really what is four potential ways to deliver education in the fall. So um, those families are entitled um, to a remote learning opportunity. We would, the, you know, the requirement is not that you quote unquote homeschool moving forward if you're not returning, even if your district is open, it would be the remote learning opportunity for your child. Great, thank you. Um, if there are other questions, please uh, put them into the chat box. We'll try and get to them um, over the last few minutes. Because, Erin, did you have anything else you wanted to add on school reopening? I just want to, one more time, just thank people for their patience. I know that it's frustrating. Um, there are a lot of questions without a lot of answer. Um, you know, it seems like we had all the time in the world to now having no time um, and really just, you know, thankful for the staff that work here. You know, they have been an integral part of these working groups. They are, you know, technically not working right now. And the number of, of staff that have volunteered to sit on some of these work groups is up in the hundreds. Um, so definitely thankful to be working in a community that, that values this work and that understands that any, you know, all the work we put in right now will, will have benefits moving into the fall and just thanking families for their patience. Um, and for you know, continuing continuing to have an open dialogue with us, some of the most insightful conversations we've had over the past week or so have been with parents about their experience this past spring to help us think about how we could do this differently moving forward and, and really provide um, the educational opportunity that we want for all of our kids here in Pembroke. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you to everyone who's helping, um, you know, and also everybody who attends the meetings. Uh, the attendance has been great. The questions uh, continue to be excellent, um, and we hope we're getting to all of them. And, you know, again, we don't always have the, have the answer, but we'll try to get you what we can uh, when we can. So with that, um, I'll give one last thing. If there are any other questions, just throw them in the chat box. Anything else from the committee before we take a motion for executive session? No, just a thank you to everyone. Great. Okay, so with that, I'll give it about another couple of seconds. Someone wants to type quickly. Okay, if not, um, it looks like we are Can as I of ask right. A question on the phone, or sorry. Sure, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, I'm. I'm a, I'm a parent with five kids in the system. I just wanted to know if, um, how do you become a member of the working group? Because I didn't see anything about that. Um, post it or anything sure so first you have to tell us your name for the record yes, um, sorry. <laughs> sorry it's, it's nicole mcdonald hi nicole mcdonald um so we had sent hi. an email out to families um about two weeks ago asking if they were interested in sitting on the um the return to school working groups and we got about i think 98 parents that had reached out and we selected 10 fam 10 parents randomly as a, a sampling of two from each building kind of with various grades to represent parents on that committee but understanding that there was so many more families that were interested in participating um, our kind of schedule going over the next six, six weeks involved um, several opportunities in almost like a town hall forum for parents that weren't selected as part of the work group to really kind of hear what our plans are and give us feedback on them and talk to us about their experiences so our first one is scheduled um, for next week I, I think Mary Beth and I are looking at Wednesday, but I'm not 100% sure because it's not sitting in front of me. But um, understanding that a small group of, of parents was selected, but wanting to create opportunities for the larger group to weigh in as well. Oh, okay. I'll have to look for the details on that. Thank you very much. And then just about special education, um, is that you said there is a work group on special ed? Yep. So, so there is a student services um, larger group that has two subgroups. One is special education and ELLs, and the other is social emotional um, supports for students. So, you know, uh, the guidance, which um, I will link in the family survey we send out tomorrow, talks about how the state is thinking about some of those high need high needs populations, like our special ed students and our English language learners, and prioritizing some in person instruction for them. And so, there's definitely some information. Um, in the in the preliminary guidance about that and then we're working towards what that looks like for our students here in Pembroke. Okay, so, thank you very much. 
So when we had just one other question uh, that did come in uh, from Maria Dunn, just want to add that the elementary specialists as of now are the only teachers who will be entering every classroom and teaching all of the students who are attending school if we went back hybrid or all back. This is a big safety concern. And I just want to make sure that we're all aware. Um, thank you for that. It is something, you know, it is a consideration. Um, and Aaron, you're working that into the plan. Want sure. to elaborate so, anything else on that? There's no plans put together yet. Obviously, one option to limit student movement is to have specialists come into the classroom, so we haven't um, necessarily decided that yet. There's still several levels of conversation that have to happen um, before we are at that point yet, but definitely appreciate the concern um, around that for staff. And I think um, you know, a couple of the specialists at the elementary level have offered some alternatives, um, which would definitely be part of the process as we talk through this stuff in the work groups. Great, thank you. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, if there's nothing else, let me double check, triple check. Okay, great. Um, at that, this point then, um, I'll take a motion to go into executive session pursuant to chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss collective bargaining strategy since an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the legal position of the of the school committee as declared by the chair. So, is there, is there thank you. Section? Second. Motion by Suzanne, second by Jim. Um, with that, um, roll call. Suzanne? Yes. See if David can get off mute. Okay, Jim? Yes. Susie? Yes. I'm a yes. Thanks, everyone. We'll be meeting again on August 4th as of right now. If something comes up and we have to meet earlier, clearly we'll schedule a meeting. Uh, but we want to thank everybody for joining, and we'll definitely talk to you no later than August 4th. Thanks, and have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. They just stopped it.